Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the what should be the second to the last uh, Levy Chair guest lecture this year. And uh, with us, we have Dr. Peter Campbell from the Cranfield University Forensic Institute, where he uh, directs the Institute's Forensic Investigation of Heritage Crime um, and works as a marine archaeologist. And the theme of today's talk will fit in with uh, the broader themes of economic geography and national security that we've been looking at this year. Um, you know, if economic geography looks at the intersection of human economic activities and the physical environment across space, um, in the maritime heritage sector, um, we have both past and present economic activities in, in the maritime domain that touch on security, including um, heritage as or artifacts as conflict resources, um, in, intersection of transnational crime, both in and through the maritime domain, um, not only involving antiquities, but combined with other, other trades, um, and also the use of heritage as a narrative in hybrid warfare and great power conflicts um, to press territorial claims to keep maritime trade routes and sea lanes. So there's a um, numerous areas where it touches upon the themes of this series. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to Peter. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I appreciate it. It's great to be with you all here uh, remotely today. So I'm going to speak about the intersection of maritime cultural heritage, uh, as I am a maritime archeologist and security. And uh, this is really a growth sector. Um, there, there's a lot of movement at the moment uh, by a number of different countries. Uh, and a lot of the people have been gathered together to discuss these things by Chris. So he's, he's really kind of leading the way on, on maritime cultural property protection. Um, so to begin, oh, let's hope this advances. There we go. So I'm just going to be speaking on these topics today. Uh, as I said, I'm a maritime archaeologist. Um, in addition to maritime archaeology, I also work on cultural heritage under threat, um, looking at transnational trafficking of cultural heritage, uh, working with groups like the OSCE um, on, on workshops and, and training of border security and customs agents. Uh, as well as, as studying, you know, the destruction and political use of cultural heritage by groups such as Islamic State. But in this talk, I'm going to talk about um, security risks from underwater cultural heritage. Now, most of us think of underwater archaeology in terms of photos like this. So this is one of our shipwrecks in Albania. It's a fourth century AD Roman shipwreck carrying uh, garum or fish sauce. And what you see on the seafloor are a pile of uh, amphoras, these kind of bulk carriers. They're essentially the barrels of antiquity uh, and they're still lying there in the shape of the ship. Well, not every shipwreck is as inert as this one. Uh, so I'm going to touch on one, first just define underwater cultural heritage and discuss it in terms of global contexts, but then talk about um, un unexploded underwater ordnance uh, and its use, potential use by criminals as a re resource the potential disruptions to global trade and uh, transportation, transnational threats, and, and then kind of criminal and terror financing as well. And then and, and kind of big picture with uh, the weaponization of archaeology uh, for conflict uh, that's, that's currently ongoing in the world today. So what is underwater cultural heritage? So it is essentially archaeology underwater. Uh, it's typically thought of as shipwrecks, but it's much more than that. Uh, there's a lot of types of sites that are, are overlooked. And the key takeaway is that every country has underwater cultural heritage, even landlocked countries. Uh, and you need to think of it in much more than just dollar figures. These are important sites for cultural identity and social cohesion. Uh, these are the sites that hold communities together. And so here are some great examples. Obviously you have shipwrecks like the one we discussed in Albania, uh, but you also have ships that are sunk in harbors uh, like in Turkey over on the right. You have sunken cities, uh, which you have in the middle there with Baia in Italy, uh, which is a Roman, Roman 
city full of villas that submerged due to volcanic earth movements. Uh, and paleo landscapes, and these are huge tracts of land, such as the, the photo in Sweden on the right in the middle, uh, where global sea levels used to be much higher and have now been submerged. You have sacred springs, you have aircraft, you have isolated finds like the Riace bronzes right in the middle. And then you have lakes. And so down in the bottom, uh, in the center and to the right, you have, have two lakes, one with a basilica and another with shipwrecks. And so it's much more than just shipwrecks in the ocean. Uh, you have lots and lots of different types of sites. So even incredibly landlocked countries such as Mongolia, for example, has rich underwater cultural heritage in its lakes and rivers. Now, as I said, you have to think beyond dollar figures for these types of sites. They are important for social cohesion, community growth, and sustainable economic development. And so if we look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, it touches on a number of them that I have listed there. And so because of this, uh, underwater cultural heritage tells us about the human past, often in better detail than sites on land where you might have a city being built over uh, in multiple iterations over centuries. A shipwreck or a sunken city in the ocean uh, or a lake or, or elsewhere uh, is often preserved. It, it has that time capsule element. So often we have better preserved narratives about the past from underwater sites than we do on land. Uh, so they're really, really critical sites, uh, though they're often overlooked because they are difficult to access. Only certain uh, percentages of the population can access them through diving or, or other remote activities. Um, so they are a challenging uh, aspect because they are out of the, both the public consciousness, but also out of the consciousness of law enforcement, military, and other groups. So as a maritime archaeologist, uh, we are concerned about security risks, uh, as well as other things such as pollution and hazards associated with these heritage sites that could, one, impact the integrity of these sites, uh, and, and impact how long they will survive into the future, uh, but also how the public engages with them. So certainly security risks are a concern in terms of both preserving our past, but also the public's engagement with them. And so since this is the Naval War College, I'm just going to quickly mention uh, an example of our ongoing research. Uh, so in 2004, the Italian Carabinieri raided a home in Sicily and captured this object over on the left. And this is a bronze warship ram dating to the third century BC. And uh, the fisherman was, a, he had pulled it up in his nets and he was attempting to traffic it out of Italy uh, onto the illicit antiquities uh, market. And, uh, probably find a buyer overseas, uh, a private collector. They prevented him and they turned it over to the Superintendenza del Mare, the superintendent of the sea in Sicily, who contacted an American not-for-profit uh, to search for where this ram came from because it was only the third, at that time, the third known example of what was the pinnacle of ancient warships. So ancient warships would smash into each other and try and sink each other. And uh, what happened was, it was determined that this ram came from the Battle of the Egedi Islands, which was the ultimate battle, the, the final battle of the First Punic War, where Rome went from a regional power to a Mediterranean power. And uh, so it's one of the most important battles in history. And because this was turned over, an international team led by the Superintendenza del Mare, especially Sebastiano Tusa, who's the director, together with RPN Nautical Foundation, an American nonprofit, and Global Underwater Explorers, a group of, of deep sea divers, uh, have been searching this for the last 15 years. We have another season planned for August and uh, have found many, many more of these bronze rams, as well as all these other associated artifacts, uh, locating the first ancient naval battle that's been found uh, on the seafloor. Of all the ancient naval battles that occurred throughout history, uh, this is the only one that's been found because it's so difficult to find small objects on the seafloor. And uh, so here you can see it's, it's the only known ancient naval battle, rewritten what we understand about ancient naval battles. Uh, and so why I, I mentioned it, one, because of the audience, but two, 
because this is really an exceptional example of how law enforcement and archaeology can work together for the public benefit and how a, a crime, a trafficking transnational crime that was about to occur was stopped. And this resulted in sustainable economic development for the region. There's a museum now on one of the local islands displaying the artifacts. These artifacts have been shared in museum, traveling museum exhibits around the world uh, from throughout Europe to Australia. And uh, it, it's completely rewriting history books. There's been lots of documentaries made and that sort of thing. So it just goes to show that uh, there's enormous potential for objects in the sea uh, that can be used for criminal activity, uh, but uh, working together, uh, incredible things can happen between law enforcement and archeology. span So that was a brief aside, but now specifically on security. So I work on a lot of shipwrecks, uh, but probably the only thing I've found more than shipwrecks in the ocean are bombs. There are unexploded ordnance all over the seafloor uh, in huge numbers. Um, so it, not only are the numbers significant, but for those who work at sea, they are incredibly accessible. And uh, they can be found on naval vessels that have sunk. They can be found uh, just in terms of uh, bombing runs that were where bombs were dropped on vessels or on on practice targets that uh, did not explode and they're sitting on the sea or in munition dumps and there are quite large munition dumps that you come across they're just sitting on the seafloor with thousands of bombs sitting there quite readily accessible uh the example that i most uh experienced with is World War II explosives in the Mediterranean because I work a lot with fishing communities, free divers, uh, sponge divers throughout the Mediterranean, and they all know where bombs are and often they bring up bombs. And uh, one of my local informants uh, on, on a small island, uh, I am not using any names because this is being recorded and will be broadcast, so I won't mention any countries or individuals, of course. Um, but so one of my local informants spoke about a small island that was near a U.S. base during World War II, and it was used for practicing strafing runs, and they were using live ammunition, and so they were, or, or bombs, I'm not sure the technical terms, you can hear I don't have a military background myself. Um, so they would drop the bombs on this island to practice, and then uh, every once in a while, some of them wouldn't detonate, and they would go down, sink to the bottom of the seafloor around this island. And so for generations now, uh, two or three generations, um, these divers, families have been going and recovering the unexploded bombs, bringing them back into small remote bays. They diffuse them, take out the explosives, and then subdivide those into smaller units. And then they sell them to other fishermen for a hundred euros each. And they use this for dynamite fishing. Essentially they will go into small bays often in the morning. Um, we had one site where we found a 16th century shipwreck as well as Roman ruins. And one morning when we, when we showed up, a fisherman was just leaving. And when we dove down in the water, there were dead fish and octopus and everything all over the sea floor. And uh, what he had been doing was he had waited for the morning schooling of fish in this bay, um, not recognizing or, or caring that there was archaeology in this bay. And uh, he dropped the dynamite off the side. Uh, it explodes, sends out a shockwave, and then a, port, a, a large amount of fish float to the surface, but an equally large amount sink to the bottom. And this is a way to, to very easily fish in large numbers, but it's incredibly destructive. Uh, but this is a very common fishing technique, even though it's illegal in almost every country uh, throughout the Mediterranean, and it's primarily using explosives left over from, from World War II. Uh, and then you also have weapons of mass destruction uh, from conflicts such as the Balkan Wars in the 90s, uh, where these were taken and the safest place that was determined to discard them was the sea. And they're still lying down there and you, you can you come across them in marine survey. Uh, obviously, they're dumped much deeper than the kind of coastal um, scuba diving would find, but you find them with, um, with marine research vessels and marine work, work boats um, and, and using um, robots, so remotely operated vehicles and autonomous underwater vehicles. And so they are accessible to, to people who work at sea. Uh, one of the really um, 
incredible and, and, and quite sad examples of looting of naval vessels uh, has taken place very recently in the Java Sea. And this was scrap metal looting of World War shipwrecks. Um, this include British, American, Dutch, and Australian warships. And you can see some of them pictured here. And these sites were identified quite recently in marine survey. And they, the vessels were found in, in relatively intact on the seafloor, standing upright. And just uh, a year or two later, when the same marine research companies went back to see the wrecks, uh, notably a Dutch archaeological company, they found nothing left of the ships at all, just holes in the ground. And you can see in the lower left, the multi-beam image of these, uh, just the hole that was left in what used to be an entire warship. And so these are scrap metal uh, solvers who are trying to get the metal from these warships. Uh, but of course they are recovering other things as well. They are recovering human remains, um, a, a, a grave full of, of remains that were dumped after being brought up were found recently in Indonesia. And uh, of course they're finding unexploded ordnance on these vessels as well. So I think this is a great example of how accessible large amounts of UXO are. However, there hasn't been any evidence yet of any misuse of that UXO. So um, we can't point to this, we can point to it as criminal activity in terms of illegal salvage and contravening a number of, of international laws around the protection of war graves. But uh, we can't point to it as, as use of UXO uh, for uh, criminal activity or terrorism or anything like that. But I think it points to the potential that these sites are accessible. And if somebody was looking for, for explosives for some sort of activity, um, that they are accessible from underwater. Now, another very interesting example is the SS Rich, Richard Montgomery. Uh, so this was a World War II Liberty ship that was carrying munitions Tuary, and its anchor dragged in the middle of the night and it came to rest on a sand bank. And as the tide went down the next morning, it uh, cracked its spine and it's been, it hasn't moved since. Um, it was carrying a huge amount of munitions and currently they, they unloaded as much as they could safely, but there still remains 1400 tons of explosives on board the vessel today. Uh, it was the first ship in Britain to be listed as a, a danger zone uh, in, in 1973, so quite early on. It is continuously monitored uh, with radar and visually, and they've established an exclusion zone around the vessel. Um, however, it still remains a significant uh, threat for explosion. So there's been a number of studies done. Um, it could explode at any moment due to the shifting of cargo. Uh, a vessel, if it loses power or, or uh, navigation, could crash into it, causing an explosion. Um, even the changing tide, it's been said, could shift the cargo enough that it would uh, cause an explosion. Uh, or, of course, you know, there, there could be a potential attack by somebody driving, purposely driving a vessel into the, into the shipwreck uh, could cause an explosion. Now, this is really important because it's located just outside London, uh, which would impact a lot of East London and Sheerness on the coast, as well as several airports that are in the area. Uh, because of the, the low-lying uh, land and the proximity to London, there's a number of airports in that area because that land was available to build airports uh, after the war. Um, the closest parallel that there is is the Kelsey, which was a vessel that uh, they that Similarly, Liberty ship, uh, uh, or not Liberty ship, sorry, it was, a, it was a Polish vessel, but transporting munitions. Um, and they tried to move it in 1967 and it exploded and it was carrying far less munitions um, than the, the Montgomery currently has on board. And nevertheless, it registered a 4.5 on the Richter scale. Uh, so sign and significantly impacted the coastline uh, in the vicinity. So you can see that, and, and, and the Kelsey is the reason why more work hasn't been done to remove the munitions from the Montgomery because there's a, a, a great amount of fear that of course this explosion could impact both those removing the munitions, but also um, all of East London. Um, so it's a bit of a conundrum in terms of what to do, but you can see how this is essentially a ticking time bomb sitting right next to London. And of course, 
the Montgomery is very well studied being near London and, and, and the British Maritime um, Authority um, monitoring it. But of course, there are sites like this um, in harbors and outside major cities uh, and even in rivers all around the world from the World Wars. So, I mean, this is not an isolated vessel. Of course, you have these sorts of, of wrecks all over the place. So every year there are disruptions to maritime activities from UXO. Um, as more maritime survey is done, that includes magnetometry surveys and these are identifying ordnance underwater. Uh, when I was working in Albania, for example, uh, we were diving looking for ancient shipwrecks and we found something that looked a lot like a, a ancient Roman amphora, like the ones you saw in that, that photo from that Roman shipwreck uh, and started dusting it off and all of these these kind of um, rust particles started flying up and we realized that this was in fact a World War II bomb. And when we went to the surface, we looked over and we were not that far from an Italian hospital ship that had been bombed by the Germans after the Italian surrender uh, and, and part of Germany's vindictive campaign against Italy for surrendering. And uh, this appeared to be one of those bombs that were used to, to sink that vessel, but it, had, it never exploded and land on the seafloor. This is right in the middle of the largest harbor in Southern Albania, uh, which has significant ship traffic. And so the area had to be cleared and then it was blown up in situ by the Albanian um, demining group. Uh, but it's not alone. You know, there, There's examples of that every year where bombs are found in major waterways uh, and harbors and uh, they have to be blown up. And there's, there's enormous potential for an anchor dragging and striking one or, or a vessel grounding on top of one and, and setting it off. So uh, there's significant risk involved from all the unexploded ordnance. And what you have to consider about underwater cultural heritage is that the places that were significant in the past for ships continue to be today. And so underwater cultural heritage is clustered around certain nodes such as strategic straits, um, islands, uh, all the places that are still important today uh, were important in the past. And so you find the bulk of shipwrecks uh, as well as submerged harbor facilities and that sort of thing in these same regions. So there's, there's a, a significant risk for both un, unexploded ordnance, but also risk to underwater cultural heritage through these, through these issues. And so when you're looking at straits and choke points like Gibraltar, Malacca, Hormuz, the Turkish Straits, um, you can see how, how the underwater cultural heritage plays a role in, in kind of the security risks associated with these areas and their maritime activities today. Um, so the, the accidental, but also the purposeful, potentially purposeful detonation of UXO in these waterways could severely disrupt trade and transport. Uh, and I think that's, that's kind of very well demonstrated by the Ever Given, as we all recently witnessed in real time, how prone global trade networks are to disruption from a vessel grounding. And, and you know, there's often been a discussion in security circles about, you know, what would happen if um, tankers were sunk in strategic waterways um, and strategic straits around the world, that, that would be, you know, um, significant hindrance and shut down global trade for different periods of time. Um, but you add into the mix that a lot of these sites were used in the world wars uh, and other conflicts, and you have unexploded ordnance that uh, potentially a vessel could strike those and sink. And then you again have disrupted it in a, in a similar way to, to ever given block in the Suez. Uh, so on to transnational threats, which is my primary area of research. Uh, so I look at antiquities trafficking networks and uh, how robust but simple networks function and, and how you have constantly changing actors. These aren't necessarily all career criminals, um, but, you know, they're farmer, fishermen, police on occasion, politicians, uh, museum curators and academics all playing a role coming in uh, to make money opportunistically at different times and uh, intermixed within this antiquities trade are arms, narcotics and human trafficking, as well as cigarettes and everything else under the sun. The smuggling networks that move antiquities are also those that move all of these other items. And, uh, and so the structure of the trade um, is much more complex and difficult to disrupt 
than a traditional criminal hierarchy. So these trafficking networks are generally fluid networks instead of hierarchies. So uh, the typical example of the hierarchy is the mafia. And uh, so if you disrupt, you can use the people at the bottom to disrupt the hierarchy moving up. And if you cut off the head, then, then largely the hierarchy can collapse. And so that's why um, you've often used kind of footmen to go after uh, the mafia dons and you arrest the dons and, and that's largely then crime disrupted. But with these fluid networks, it's much more complex. The person doing the looting on the front end often has no contact whatsoever with the person on the back end. Uh, instead, you have a bunch of kind of middlemen throughout popping in and out and uh, it's, not, it's not a hierarchy and a, a steady chain that's used over and over. Instead, it's typified by single transactions at convergence settings. And so it's constantly different people. And what you see is you have people that are very prominent looters moving large amounts of material, but they're giving them to different middlemen and traffickers along the way. And you have traffickers that are, are communicating with different people as well. Uh, you have people that make one-off fines, such as a fisherman who pulls up something in his nets and sells it on. And these all flood into arterial networks, trafficking, moving the antiquities towards, um, towards markets, predominantly in the West, but also growing in the East. Um, but it's very different from the hierarchy and you're, you can't disrupt it by focusing simply on either end. Instead, you have to focus on the middle. And there's a great uh, quote here by Timothy Green who talks about the complexities of these where it's really hard to see how these networks fit together because it is such a different structure from hierarchies. And so what this means is that um, underwater antiquities also feed into these networks and it's much less studied than the, the looting and trafficking of materials from land. Uh, but there's some great examples such as uh, the Fiale of Acris, which was looted from Sicily uh, sometime in the 70s and then sold around to a bunch of different uh, very suspicious characters in Sicily before being sold to um, dealers in Geneva and New York and then on to a very prominent collector in New York who eventually had to surrender it. Uh, but it's thought it was thought that this was originally looted from a city but recently it's been proposed this was actually looted from a shipwreck, a shipwreck that might have also been carrying statuary elements that have turned up elsewhere in Sicily for sale and, and some of them handed over into museums. And so there, it might be the product of a very high end shipwreck that was uh, from the late antique period carrying a bunch of cargo that uh, fishermen had been dragging and then secretly selling these artifacts on the, on the antiquities market. And so this is my model of the illicit antiquities trade, uh, which I published in a paper in 2013 um, as a method of trying to understand how you can have such diverse characters involved uh, in the trade uh, and yet still have arterial networks. And so you're constantly changing participants uh, and yet the movement of large scale objects. And you can see that um, you have the looters in the first stage who are by and large impoverished individuals um, or on the, the lower end of the economic scale uh, who are, are the largest population within the trade who are doing a lot of looting. So in terms of maritime cultural heritage, this would be fishermen, free divers, sponge divers um, who are working to collect and harvest objects from the sea, uh, from sponges to fish, to clams, all that sort of thing. And occasionally come across um, shipwrecks, sunken cities, that sort of thing, uh, and recover objects from them. Then you have the second stage, which is the traffickers. And so these are the experts in moving things across border because the people in the first stage, we rarely see them having this skill set you know, they're generally, their skill set, they're very knowledgeable about local conditions and the local environment, and they know where to find the, the archaeology, but they don't know how to move things across borders. And so that's where you have the second stage, where you have kind of jack of all trade traffickers. These are the people who are also moving arms, narcotics, cigarettes, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and then you have the third stage, which is generally in the market country. So, you know, this is London, New York, Tokyo. This is the smallest population because these are the people who have to launder those trafficked goods onto the legal market. Because with the antiquities trade, you have to have uh, a legal market. The collectors are generally very wealthy individuals. 
uh, who don't want to own <laughs> illicit goods and they want to be able to show them to people who visit or they want to loan them to museums for display. And so this very small population are generally academics, um, curators, specialists of different type, um, very talented um, uh, uh, auctioneers and gallery owners and that sort of thing. And they clean up the objects, conserve them. Uh, they create often a false provenance and say, oh, this is prior to the 1970 UNESCO convention, that sort of thing. And then they sell them onto the collectors, uh, which is a, a larger population, but still smaller than, than the first two stages. Uh, and so, you know, speaking generally, there's of course exceptions to this model, but speaking generally, this is what we see. Uh, you can have one or more people in each stage. It changes all the time, but this is generally the route that objects move through. And so I say this because there is significant money to be made in the illicit antiquities trade. And so if you look at criminal and financing, um, there's the last 10 years of Islamic State where they were under the territory that they controlled, um, issuing permits to loot archaeological sites and then sell them. And then they would collect a tax off of that. And so there was significant um, money to be made from antiquities uh, for, by Islamic State. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but we also see it with other groups like the Haqqani Network in Afghanistan and, and others where they are selling uh, or permitting the looting and trafficking of illicit antiquities uh, for a percentage of profit. Now, this is also true for the maritime sphere, but there's much less focus on the maritime side of things compared to on land. Uh, but there are certainly examples that are known. Uh, there, there are certainly examples of the mafia uh, dealing in illicit antiquities. Uh, but one of the recent examples that's quite interesting is a bronze statue that was found off the coast of Gaza by a fisherman in 2013. Uh, it appears to be, and I say appears because very little is known about this, the, other than the photo that you see and a few others, that's all we know about this because it disappeared. It appears to be a first to second century AD copy of a Roman statue, a Roman copy of a Greek statue, uh, which is incredibly rare. Um, if this were legal and had had a, uh, a, a provenience and a, a record prior to 1970, and it came up for sale on the market today, uh, this would sell for millions. Um, so the, the potential value of this for criminal or terror groups is enormous. Um, so this statue was found by the fisherman. He brought it up. Uh, his family was rejoicing. They thought maybe it was gold. So they cut off a finger to look and they could see that the, the copper uh, within the bronze made it look like it was gold. Um, they tried to find a way to sell it. Uh, but in the course of all of that, it was confiscated by Hamas. Hamas took it and it's disappeared and we don't know where it, it, it ended up um, it, today. It, it, it maybe disappeared into a smuggling network, sold to a collector. We just don't know. We don't know what happened to it. Uh, it appeared briefly on eBay uh, being sold for half a million dollars. Uh, and it said, pick up only in Gaza. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's not easy to just buy Gaza and pick up uh, very large, heavy objects. Uh, so it did not sell. And uh, it's unclear who posted it, but it might have been the fisherman's family who posted that trying to sell it, uh, but, uh, but it was quickly confiscated. Uh, so then kind of looking up on a larger scale, um, to end, I, I just want to look at kind of what governments are doing um, and, and kind of uh, great powers and, and kind of uh, elbowing each other for territorial expansion. Um, it's very difficult to expand territory on land these days, despite uh, recent conflicts uh, where territories have been expanded by Azerbaijan and um, by, by Russia into the Ukraine and elsewhere. Uh, it's quite difficult to expand on land, but the sea is rife for expansion. So there's the, there is the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which governs what territorial waters belong to different countries. Uh, and for a while, countries were happy with that to some extent, <laughs> some more than others. Um, but in the 90s in particular, and in the 2000s, there was a big rush for marine minerals. And it, it really became evident 
uh, the amount of resources and money available at sea from marine minerals. And as a result, countries started looking at their neighbors and they started looking beyond uh, the territorial waters, looking to see where there might be resources for extraction. And so this led to countries trying to expand their maritime territory. And one of the easy excuses for expanding territory is saying our cultural archeology, span our cultural patrimony is lying in those unclaimed areas or in our neighbor's areas. And so therefore that's evidence of our flag being planted there. And we wanna claim that territory. Um, so this is an article I wrote for the New York Times and an op-ed um, about some issues that had arisen in 2015 that were quite acute and, and kind of warranted closer inspection. And that was the use of archeology span to expand territorial claims. And uh, a number of things happened in 2015, if you all remember, in the South China Sea, in Ukraine. Um, there, there were, it, was, it was quite a touch point uh, that year. And what had happened is China had uh, been expanding. In this 2015 was the year they were building the islands in the South China Sea um, to build their bases. And uh, this was right in the beginning of the construction. But what preceded the construction of those islands? archaeological missions. And so they were sending out maritime archaeologists to look for shipwrecks and to prove that China had been sailing in those areas that they were claiming for centuries. Uh, and certainly they found shipwrecks. They found over 100 shipwrecks that they attributed to being Chinese. Um, you know, but, but attributing a shipwreck to a culture is very difficult because often uh, ships are melting pots. And so it, it's really difficult, but that's what was done. Um, so that's China and the South China Sea. Uh, Canada located the Airbus and Terror, which were the British exploration vessels uh, looking for the Northwest Passage. They located them in the Northwest Passage. And uh, this corresponded with the period of the first passage by a cargo vessel through the Northwest Passage. Um, during due to global warming, warming the Northwest Passage and the vessel was able to, to get through. And so it, the timing was very peculiar, um, though, to be fair, Parks Canada had been searching for, the, for those vessels for a long time and uh, working with the local indigenous communities uh, who knew exactly where the ships were, they were able to find them. Um, but uh, nevertheless, the Prime Minister of Canada in 2015 took uh, great pride in announcing that uh, these vessels have been found in the Northwest Passage and that it was Canada's right to, to maintain the passage. Um, Russia, uh, 2015, if you remember, of course, uh, Ukraine. Uh, prior to the invasion and claiming of Ukraine, um, they had been spending an enormous amount of money um, proving Russian uh, identity and, and archaeology in the Kerch Strait directly. I mean, it's two kilometers or, kil or a kilometer and a half away from, from Ukraine, um, spending enormous amounts of money on shipwrecks and, and harbors and the, the city on land in the Kerch Strait, proving Russian cultural patrimony uh, in the Black Sea region. And uh, immediately after Ukraine, after Crimea was claimed um, by Russia, they sent out archaeological missions looking for shipwrecks off of their new territorial waters, uh, which they claimed but haven't been affirmed by, by the international community. Uh, but you can see that, that maritime archaeology is preceding these territorial claims and, and following them as well. Uh, and finally, Spain. And, and Spain is, uh, has argued that their shipwrecks um, from the colonial period, from the age of exploration in the Atlantic, um, should be part, should justify an expanded exclusive economic zone for them in the Atlantic, uh, around the Canary Islands and even larger, uh, because their ca cultural patrimony is sunk on the bottom of the seafloor there. And it's interesting, they argue that the treasure hunters that have been stealing their cultural patrimony um, are the reason why those sites need to be protected and why it should be there um, their expanded um, economic zones. So quite interesting examples. And I don't think we're gonna see the end of this anytime soon. I think other nations are gonna to continue to, to weaponize archeology span in this way uh, to justify maritime expansion. And certainly archeology span has been used in the past for expansion on land. 
Um, there's great examples from, from Europe of people invading other countries because archeological remains have been found in those countries. And they claim that that's their cultural patrimony and therefore an, an invasion is justified. Uh, such as Germany invading Denmark uh, in the uh, Schleswig-Holstein Wars. Uh, and that included a shipwreck as well that was confiscated and brought back to Germany and put on display. Um, but yeah, in the last decade in particular, maritime archaeology has been used to justify um, the expansion of, of the, the EEZs. So increasingly, this is becoming an issue. And as I said, I, I think it's not the end anytime soon. So to conclude, um, you know, underwater cultural heritage, it's found in every country. It's critical for our understanding of the past. It's critical for social cohesion, community development, sustainable economies. Unfortunately, it's one of the world's most rapidly declining resources because of widespread looting and treasure hunting. Um, so you have this, this incredibly important resource. It's being extracted and destroyed at a really fast rate. Uh, and then you add into the mix of that possible security risks. Uh, so from my perspective, uh, you know, we have to maintain underwater cultural heritage because it is the future of many communities. It is critical to sustainable uh, economies, uh, tourism, all of that sort of thing. Uh, but we have to be realistic about security, but also other aspects like pollution, uh, especially leaking oil from, from World War II wrecks and, and, and more recent wrecks. And so investment in identifying and assessing underwater cultural resources, both by archaeology and military and police and law enforcement and border security, uh, I think all these stakeholders working together will help one, improve security, but two, also help develop a sustainable economy. So thank you all very much. I appreciate it. And if you have any questions, please ask them now.